stage, uh, it's at this point in the semester, it's very common for me not to be quite on schedule, and that's the situation we're in now. There's a little bit left over from the previous lecture uh, to go over, but I actually have fire breaks, as I call them, built into the course, uh, lectures that don't necessarily take all 50 minutes, and we've got one coming up on um, Wednesday. For that matter, the one on uh, Friday is one that can sort of absorb this as well. So we will be caught up. So last time I was talking about the how fossils form and the different modes of preservation, as we call them. So you know, a fossil could be unaltered. You haven't added anything to it, and you've only lost maybe like water and liquids and so forth. And especially with the hard parts, they're all still there. Or, you know, permineralization. That's the most common mode for fossil bones and teeth, particularly for things like dinosaurs of that age, where the original hard parts are still there, maybe even some of the original soft uh, or, or firm tissue, like collagen and keratin, is still there. But the pore space has been filled up to some degree with other minerals. And that's why a fossil bone, a quote unquote petrified bone, looks like and breaks like rock. It doesn't break like fresh bone. But the original bony material is still there. That's something that people didn't appreciate for, you know, in the 19th century, they didn't really understand it. Much of the 20th century, they weren't really up on that. By the later 20th century, when chemical assays were used, like, oh, okay, hydroxyl appetite's still there. Um, and, you know, replacement, where you actually have lost the original hard parts and added something else to fill in that space. And I just finished by talking about carbonization, which doesn't typically have to deal with the hard tissues, the bones and so forth. For instance, this is a permineralized anchiornis, a very primitive member of the bird lineage, um, in terms of its the skeletal material, but it's carbonized in terms of the soft material. Remember, carbonization is where the original organic material is compressed between layers of sediment, and that way, um, but you need very fine-grained sediments, you know, very fine clays and so forth to preserve that. Um, but if they do preserve it, then you can see details of soft tissue or soft-ish tissue, like feathers and fur, scale and so forth. Um, and that those details actually exist all the way down to, well, the molecular level, but including like the scanning electron microscope. You can see the internal structures of the feathers of Anchiornis. But to point out, you know, these are the remains of dead animals. And not all the animals that settle down at this particular layer are necessarily as well preserved. Just like if you were walking around outside, sometimes you'll, you might find a, a dead bird that's pretty fresh. But sometimes it might have been picked apart by scavengers, and sometimes it might be something in between. So this is from the same site. And although in terms of the skeleton, it's just about equally good. This doesn't have the good carbonized material around it. Same species, same site, but slightly different modes of preservation. One thing I didn't show, so this is a new image, is that as time goes by, we're getting new and more sophisticated modes of getting data from fossils. And through a process, you don't need to know it for this class, uh, quite frankly, I barely understand the details of the science here. Um, it's called laser simulated fluorescence. My, my summary of this is shoot lasers at it, get science. But it's a way of illuminating the fossil using uh, lasers, which then the material, the different types of material on it, um, fluoresce. They glow in different ways. And it turns out on this specimen, not only was there the clear to the naked eye um, remains of the feathers, there's also an impression, which is actually carbonized to some degree, of the living tissue. Now, it's not pristine. You're not going to get DNA from it. We're not getting Jurassic Park. It's telling you that. But it's information we might not otherwise have because it picks up details through this process that you might not see with the naked eye. Like, look at these toe pads. You can see the little bottom of the toes of this Anchiornis. Um, we know that, they, that many dinosaurs had toe pads, like their living representatives, the birds, uh, because we've seen their footprints, but here we can actually see them preserved in a fossil, which is pretty cool. Now, there's another 
type of fossil, uh, a body fossil out there where none of the original material is there. And those are the general category of impressions. So in this case, when the animal was still stinking, <laughs> but it still had organic material on it, and was lying against the sediment, it's impressing the sediment. It's not, it's, it's, its body is pushing into the sediment. And then that body decays, and other sediment comes in and fills in those spaces. And what you get is a 3D duplicate of the original soft tissues. But none of the atoms here were part of the animal. This is sand or mud or whatever that's filled it in. So these are, we can see the 3D representation of the skin of this dinosaur. But this is actually sediment. And of course, the, you also get the counterparts, the stuff that's been impressed into. So that's a, a negative of the original. It's not a duplicate, it's the negative. So each of these uh, roundish scales in this 3D positive would have had another piece in the sediment that was a, an impression into it, a 3D negative. And just to show you, know, here's some of the sort of material. Here's some toe pads preserved, for instance, on this um, medium-sized carnivorous dinosaur. So different pathways to preserve fossils. Even when we're thinking about skeletal material, bones and teeth and so forth, the quality of the preservation varies. We, like, we would love to find completely articulated skeletons, that is all the bones stuck together, but those are the rarest type of skeletal fossils out there. So the, by far, the most common type of bony fossils you find out there are fragments. In part because as the organism was dead, it was being scavenged and decayed and it broke apart. It might have been transported to some degree and that broke it apart some more before it was buried. And then when it was exposed to the surface, modern weathering breaks it up even more. So by far the most common thing you find are little chunkosaurs, or in this case, chunk of Cales. Um, that's sort of a joke. Um, so Cales is turtle, and most of these are bits of turtle shell. But there's some other bits of bone here that may be dinosaurian. Most of that is turtle. Or here. Here's another piece of you know, fragments. It's a bit of a, a bone, you know, probably triceratops here. Now, the next most common sort of bone you would find, other than fragments, would be isolated bones, single bones by themselves. The bodies are decaying, they're falling apart, the soft tissues and firm tissues that once stuck the bones together decay, and the bodies separate apart. And different chunks of the body might be more or less durable, so that, for instance, a big, in this case, arm bone, humerus, might hang together pretty well because it's a pretty durable chunk, whereas a long rib is likely to get broken into smaller chunks. So this was a single humerus, upper arm bone, of a duck dinosaur that we collected back in 2012. And here, a single vertebra of a small plant-eating dinosaur, small-ish plant-eating dinosaur called Descalosaurus um, that I was helping to uncover. We actually did find some more of its vertebrae nearby. By the way, these, fra oh, hang on. these fragments here, that little black shiny stuff, that's coal. So what sort of environment does that tell us that this dinosaur was found in? Yeah. Swamp. Swampy environment, exactly. That there was a lot of plant material, and that plant material was accumulating and buried faster than it could decay. Articulated bones, that is bones that are still in the position they were in life, so sort of stuck together, um, are rarer than isolated bones. So here are bits of a limb, an arm, of a small crocodile. And actually, this is about you know, 10 meters into that, maybe less than that, from that other specimen I just showed you. So even in the same spot, you can have different levels of articulation. And complete skeletons, or nearly complete skeletons, you know, whole strings of articulated bones together, these are by far the rarest of all. They're the most special. 
And to be fair, even this isn't entirely in life position, nor is it complete. And I, I would wish I could have told you I found this, but I wasn't on this expedition at all. Uh, I'd love to have worked out there in Xinjiang, but I haven't done that yet in my life. So for instance, these hip bones have come apart from and are upside down relative to the rest of the body. There's some disarticulation of some of the ribs. The ribs, some of the ribs have been lost, but in general, this is in really, really good shape. Now, you have different fossilization potentials, so different possibilities of getting fossilized um, in terms both of the size of the organism and the depositional environment. So if you wanted to find like this, a big animal in articulation, this is a, uh, a young individual of the Tyrannosaurus gorgosaurus. It's young, as shown, actually, as projected. This is pretty close to life size. So the whole animal would get much larger as an adult. And it's almost entirely there. It's one of the best specimens of gorgosaurus ever found. To get a big animal in articulation, you typically need either very rapid rates of sedimentation, like a stream at flood stage or a desert sandstorm, because you want to bury it while it's still together before it's been decayed. Or maybe some special circumstance, like around a watering hole towards the end of the dry season, when even the scavengers are getting rare, but right before the wet season comes in and you get a new bunch of mud getting washed in as part of the wet season rains, the initial monsoon rains or something. Those are great ways to get big animals in articulation. In contrast, to get small animals in articulation, you don't want high energy for the most part, because higher energy, faster moving water, is likely to break them apart. You could get lucky sometimes where a small animal gets stuck underneath a bigger animal as it's getting washed along and it basically protects it, or maybe it gets stuck, stuck under a log, that can help. But really the best way that we find small animals in articulation is quiet environments where the bottom isn't disturbed, things like lake beds and lagoons. So if the body is relatively intact, by the time it settles to the bottom of that lake or the bottom of the lagoon where the oxygen levels are so low, then we got a really good chance of preserving it, like this little Chuodont dinosaur. Also, different types of sedimentary rocks have different fossilization potential because remember, every rock is a record of the environment in which it formed, and one aspect of that environment is the energy of the environment. So if you're digging in a conglomerate, remember conglomerates are those rocks with very large pebbles and cobbles in them, those might be good for individual large isolated bones, but that's a very high energy environment. So it's unlikely that you're going to find stuff in articulation. The water's moving so fast, it's likely going to tear apart the bodies. And it's very bad for the preservation of small bones, because they're probably getting smashed up by the rolling pebbles and cobbles. Sandstones are wonderful sites for fossilization. It's a nice medium. So not too slow, not too fast. Because of that, it can cover the bodies really well. It's also pretty good because of that for articulated skeletons, especially of larger animals. Mudstones are also good for most size fossils. For instance, when a river is at flood stage, in the flood plain, as it's called, as it's talked about before, that's an area where you get a lot of deposition in the form of mud and silts. And it's likely going to cover those bodies well, if there was an animal that maybe already dead or maybe was killed by the flood. But mudstones are also the best thing to preserve small bones. So it's something that's worth noting. The environments that are good for preserving big animals are often not good for preserving small animals and vice versa. So because of that, each type of depositional environment is sort of a different window into the past, but none are entirely clear windows, if you want to take that analogy further. That is, we're going to be missing some of the details depending on the preservational environment. And I just want to end with this unusual, uh, unexpected depositional setting. This is um, in, from the what's called the middle, middle Jurassic to the very beginning of the late Jurassic time period in China. 
This, in fact, is where that articulated skeleton I showed you before came from. And it was noted by the expeditions from China and um, the US that were working out there, and Canada, that's right, um, that many of the best articulated spe specimens were found in little pods like this. These sort of cylindrical blocks of mudstone. And inside them, they typically found small articulated dinosaurs with maybe a few larger articulated or partially articulated skeletons of carnivores at the top. And they were wondering, what's going on here? Why are the dinosaurs dying in these small pits? And then they started to map out the orientation of these pits. And it looks to be that what they were finding were the tracks of a giant long-necked sauropod dinosaur. Now, that giant long-necked sauropod dinosaur was not going around going, I hate you, crushing these things under feet. But rather, like if you're on a beach, you know, sometimes you're at the beach and you're playing around in the sand, you're walking, and you make a little quicksand with your feet. Anyone ever done that before? Good, yeah, okay. Um, we're now in the non-zoom, non, non asynchronous era, so I can get feedback. So these guys will do the same. Well, maybe they're not playing, but simply by walking along, they're basically creating, or we're creating, quick quicksand pits. And then if there's just a small little dinosaur doing its business, running along, it gets stuck in the quicksand. And maybe it's still alive and making calls, you know, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Or maybe it's dead and it's beginning to stink. The larger carnivore comes around, mmm, tasty food stuck here. Oh, crap. And it gets stuck. So the trick is don't walk behind giant sauropods. Okay. So now the new lecture for today, which again will continue on into into Wednesday's lecture, is going to be our look at deep time. With answering the question, how old is that fossil? So we've looked at how rocks form, we've looked at how fossils form. Now let's figure out how do we determine the age of fossils. So right here, this is a bit of a long bone, a limb bone, a femur, in fact, a thigh, of a small-ish tyrannosaur, probably a young tyrannosaurus rex that we were we didn't really collect this one, it had fallen apart too much, but we did mark that spot. It's out in Montana. The short answer to how old is that fossil, how we figure out how old the fossil is, is we figured out the age of the rocks in which the fossils are buried. Okay, we need no. Okay, it's a little more. We have to go into that. How do we figure out the age of the rocks in which the fossils are buried? And if you think about it, you know, remember that's what fossils are. They're once living things or traces of their behavior which are preserved to the rock record. And so if we figure out the age at which those rocks formed, that will tell us the, the time, the age, when those organisms were buried. And assuming it wasn't older fossils that got reworked and reburied, which just to tell you happens sometimes, um, that tells us when those creatures were living. And so as I mentioned in a lecture last week, we often uh, liken the rock record to, you know, the Book of Time, and individual strata as pages in the Book of Time. Well, now we're going to see how we figure out, not how they were written, we've seen that, but how we figure out when those pages were written. Now, in order to do this, we have to start with a concept here that was given the name by um, an American writer, a natural, natural history writer, McPhee, um, as Deep Time. And the name Deep Time was coined as a parallel to deep space. So, you know, the Earth is in space. It's not like the Earth and space. We're part of space. But our little planet and Earth orbit and maybe out to the moon, those are places that people have been. If we, you know, we do stuff in that range on a regular basis to some group, maybe not you or I, but our civilization does. So it's near space. But when we start to think about the immensity of space, throughout the rest of the solar system, and then our little part of the Milky Way, and then the whole Milky Way galaxy, and then the, the super cluster, or the cluster of galaxies we're in, the super cluster, this immensity of space, of deep space. Well, same thing goes with time. Our lives are measured in decades. Um, our country's histories are measured in centuries. Our civilizations in thousands of years. And those can seem like long chunks of time to you or I, because they are to you or I. 
But compared to the immensity of the geologic past, they're nothing. Deep time is a domain of millions or even billions of years. So how do we figure that out? Well, before we get there, let's think a little more about this. When we talk about time, we can think about it in two different ways. One is relative time, a sequence of events. A came before B, B before C, C and D happened at the same time, etc. So relative sequence in time. But there's also numerical time. We can express when something happened, or will happen, as a date or a duration measured in years or microseconds or millennia or whatever. We can put a number on it. Sometimes, many, um, in fact, many textbooks will refer to numerical time as absolute time. That is a bit of a misnomer, because we can be absolutely sure about relative time of sequences. And, in contrast, numerical time as a measurement, particularly when we deal with numerical deep time, is going to have error bars on it. Because it's a measurement, and in science, when we measure something, we have got to have some error bars on it, some degree. I will occasionally, by accident, refer to it as absolute time, because that's what I was taught, as I said, and all the, te all the textbooks have that. But I like to use relative versus numerical time. And it turns out relative deep time is a lot easier to read, a lot easier to recover than numerical deep time. For that matter, same thing with uh, sort of personal relative time and personal numerical time. Think about it this way. If I were to ask you, on September 13, 2017, at what minute did you get out of bed? At what minute did you shower? At what minute did you eat breakfast? You're probably unlikely to give me that to the exact minute. And maybe you're super methodical, and maybe you could. But if I asked you, in what sequence did you do those things, you're probably going to be more likely to be accurate because you know most of us have a pattern with that. It would probably depend, was it a weekday or was it a, uh, a weekend day? And I can't remember uh, that particular year which day it was. Probably a weekday. Or you know, if I were to ask you the sequence of events between the signing of the Declaration of Independence and therefore the creation of a country called the United States of America versus the first flight, first powered flight at Kitty Hawk by the Wright brothers versus the Apollo 11 moon landing, the first human landing on the moon. You could probably remember the sequence of events this happened in. I mean, you remember that the Wright brothers were American citizens, so there had to be a USA, and that you probably knew that you know, the astronauts were themselves formerly test pilots, so someone had to have had vented planes before they could be test pilots. So, um, so the sequence in time, you probably will remember. But thankfully, because there's history, we actually have the numerical time for this as well. Now, as it turns out, our ability to recover relative sequence in time was developed centuries before our ability to figure out numerical deep time. And it's part of the broad context of a science called stratigraphy. So writing about, and not only writing, but reading, in a sense, the strata, stratigraphy. And these are not the inventors of stratigraphy, but they're sort of some of the key players in the early days. Nicholas Stenup, I introduced earlier, sort of the first person to recognize the details of sedimentary rocks. And a century later, James Hutton, a Scottish farmer, but also scientist, who made important contributions to stratigraphy, although many others contributed as well. And so the data is in the strata. Or if you're British, the data is in the straight up. It doesn't matter which way you pronounce it, just make sure you make it rhyme. And these people and others developed what became called the principles of stratigraphy. You know, from this we derive other things. And the first principle of stratigraphy, the most basic one, is the principle of original horizontality. Now, often, these principles of stratigraphy, you go like, duh. But someone had to state it, or someone had to reason it out. 
And the principle of original horizontality is this, that sediment forms horizontal layers when deposited. Those horizontal layers are called strata. And so, you know, think about sediment settling at the bottom of a lake or the sea or a blanket of sediment covering the land at flood or the layers of sand getting deposited in a stream one on top of each other. And basically all those are forming horizontal layers. But it's important to say original horizontality. So here these strata are still horizontal, but nature can do some pretty impressive things. Nature can bend and fold and crack and otherwise deform rock. Um, at the surface, at the surface of the world, rock is brittle. But it doesn't take much in terms of pressure to change rock to something that's ductile, that's bendable, foldable. So here's a nice fold. So the strata over here are not horizontal, but they're a lot closer to horizontal than the strata here. And some of these are practically 90 degrees from where they originally were. Or here, if you ever drive out um, I-68 into Western Maryland, you might go through Sidling Hill, and you see these curved beds. When deposited, these were flat. They were originally horizontal, and something has happened to them since to bend them. And here, you see some that are practically horizontal, and in fact, uh, practically vertical, and some of these actually have folds within them. So, yeah, rocks don't have to stay horizontal. Whereas, in this case, these guys are pretty close to the original horizontal. But even here, they're not entirely horizontal. And the way to check that, you can look at the water level. Water always seeks a level. And you can see that these rocks are dipping, you know, less than a percent, like maybe point. 3%, something like that. Oh, sorry, 0. 0.3 degrees. But they're dipping somewhat. And here's more. And here's even more. And in fact, um, at this place, this is the Atlantic Ocean. This is in, in Portugal. Right here, we see dinosaur tracks. Now, people actually have noticed those tracks since ancient times. Uh, they, they enter our modern, or they enter the literature from in medieval uh, Portugal as being described as uh, the tracks of Mary's mule. So Mary, mother of Jesus, uh, was said to have had a magical mule that walked up like Spider-Man along these things that somehow made deep impressions of that, which, you know, um, anthropologists early on realized was probably not originally a story, a Christian story, because there's no talk, no discussion of a magical mule at all in the Bible. Uh, and in fact, it was probably some pagan goddess of the ancient Lusitanians, the people of, of Portugal, that got Christianized in folklore by the medieval times. But the important thing here is, when the dinosaur made those tracks, these weren't tilted up. They were flat, but they'd been tilted. So this tilting happens because of folding. As I said, when the rocks are under some level of burial, and you've got pressure fields, they can bend. And then subsequently, nature erodes down and expose, exposes these bended surfaces. So, yet another fold. I think the point has been made. So, yeah, no, it's not produced by undergraduates. It's not produced by, it is produced by the Earth, but in a different fashion. Now, because sometimes rocks can be tilted to 90 degrees, or even 180 degrees, you know, turned all the way upside down, or more, um, it's good that we have what we call way up indicators. Features on the top of a layer of sediment that tell us what the original direction up was. Things like raindrop marks, because rain comes from the air and goes down onto the ground. I know, this is groundbreaking science I'm explaining here. One moment. So raindrop marks is coming down. Or in mud cracks, mud cracks start wide and get narrower at the bottom. So that will give us the way up. Yeah, your question? So for example, if you find a fossil in um, strata that has been folded significantly, would you be able to tell the way up position if the bone were, because like they typically go on the ground, let's say a femur right. or something. It goes on the ground horizontally because the animal just dies flat on its side. Or right. Right. So if it's 
in a vertical position, would you be able to tell, hey, this strata has been folded because the bone is in a weird position? Yeah, the position of the bones might give us an indication that the, uh, that the strata have been turned, but the strata themselves would be even more visibly turned. And you would see the upper and lower layers of that stratum, and they wouldn't be horizontal anymore, as I've been showing. But yes, you can use things like the orientation of a body fossil or a trace fossil. So that footprint. Footprints come from above, and they squish into the ground. They're not walking on the ceiling or something. So, OK, so that was the principle of original horizontality. Now, the principle of superposition, and before I show you what the principle, before I tell you what the super, principle of superposition is, I'm going to demonstrate it. So this is my Bill Nye-ish thing. There we go. OK, so principle of superposition, eyes up here. Ta-da! Superposition. Superposition. And think about it that way, because super, as in Superman, means above or beyond. In this case, above. So here's the definition. Unless you have oh, they must have been overturned, the strata on the bottom of a stack of sediment were deposited first. The ones on top of those younger, and the ones on top of those younger still. So as long as I'm not cheating and slipping stuff in here, if I was dropping these things onto the table, the thing that was at the bottom was there first. The next thing I drop later, and this mask, I drop later than that. Superposition. Now, this only tells us relative time. We don't know how much younger this layer is from this layer. We don't know how much younger that layer is from that layer is. But we absolutely know that this layer is younger than this one, and this layer is younger than that one. We absolutely know it because there are way up indicators here, uh, because the surface on there has dinosaur tracks and tells us that this is pretty close to original horizontality. Does that make sense? Cool. And because the internet is full of cats, and cats demonstrating superposition. Or to flip this around, in general, if the rocks aren't, over, aren't overturned, the further down you go, the further back in time you're going. Now, this is a photograph of a site with dinosaur tracks. This is not an aerial photograph. The uh, photographer is standing level, photographing horizontally. And we see down here a scientist with a, a meter stick measuring some dinosaur tracks. There's some dinosaur tracks. There's also some ripple marks over here. And notice we're seeing sheets, we're seeing strata going back into the screen. So it's like we're looking at a book straight on, not tilted over. So we have two hypotheses. In hypothesis one, the strata closest to us, from our point of view, were deposited first. Then the ones beyond us, were deposited than the ones further back. So the idea here is that the stuff that he's measuring were the first ones, and then another layer, and then the next layer, and then the next layer. The whole thing lithified and was tilted that way. Hypothesis A. In science, though, we work by choosing between multiple alternative hypotheses and finding the best one. And in hypothesis B, the ones that are facing us are the youngest. Then the stuff furthest back were deposited first, and then another layer, then another layer, another layer, another layer. The whole thing lithified and was tilted 90 degrees. Which is it? A, B, or that there's insufficient data to resolve between these? Who votes for A? Who votes for B? Who votes for C? B is correct. And here's how you know. I mentioned we had ripple marks here. We got dinosaur tracks down here. They're way up indicators. They are telling us that this surface is the top. If the surface he's measuring is the top, that means the side that he's not measuring, the other side is the bottom. That means things further into the screen were deposited first. And then more, then more, then more. Then the layer he was measuring, and then the layers on top of that, the whole thing was lithified and tilted up. You have now gone from the dawn of human understanding all the way 
into the 1700s or early 1700s in terms of our understanding of geologic time. Now, as part of all this folding and, and crumpling of rocks, you know, at depth, the rocks are getting bent. But it also means that you're pushing stuff up. And as you push stuff up, you're pushing it out of D world and into E world. And erosion happens. And you generate what are called erosional surfaces or weathering surfaces, or the technical term is an unconformity. So here we see strata that were deposited, oldest to youngest. That region was then folded and uplifted. Erosion planed it down. And then new layers of sediment were deposited on top of it, producing this unconformity down here. And an unconformity means that there's a gap in time, because instead of being in D world and accumulating material, you were in E world and you lost material. This was recognized, well, a few people earlier on got it, including Steno, who actually was one of the main contributions of James Hutton, as part of the principle of cross-cutting relationships. So let's see, let's say for example, I find a piece of paper, like this, it's got a tear in it. I'll see this, a piece of paper with a tear in it. Two alternative hypotheses to explain it. I could have made a tear in the air and then moved the paper into that tear. Or alternatively, I could have had the paper there and then torn it. Of those two different hypotheses, the first one don't work. The second one is commonplace. And that's the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Short form, if something's deformed, it has to already exist. Longer form, any structure, a fold, fault, weathering surface, an intrusion of igneous rock, whatever, that cuts across or otherwise deforms strata, is necessarily younger than the rocks and structures it cuts across or deforms. You can't tear the paper if the paper's not there yet. And so in fact, what we're seeing here, the very famous spot where James Hutton was able to demonstrate this to his colleagues, we have a set of strata down here that are tilted vertically. We have an erosional surface in between the two. And then we have other strata on top. Now, neither set of strata are horizontal anymore. So we know that they've all been tilted from horizontal. But was it this package of sediment here that was deposited first, or the stuff up here? And what Hutton showed, the rocks down here are eroded by this erosional surface. They had to have existed before they got weathered. You can't weather something that doesn't exist yet. You can't tear the paper if the paper's not there. The rocks on top of this came later. They were deposited on top of the erosional surface. In fact, some of the conglomerates at the base of this contain pieces of the rock underneath. So these rocks down here are older than the erosion by cross-cutting relationships. And those rocks are younger than the erosion by superposition. Everyone see how that works. So now we've made it into the late 1700s in terms of figuring out sequence and time. We can see that here, you know, we've got a layer of sediment, a set of sedimentary strata here. We have an igneous intrusion. We have an erosional surface. We've got another layer of strata, and we've got the Colorado River. We're looking at this from the side. They've been eroded as well. So that gives us a sequence. This, these strata were accumulated bottom to top. They were then intruded by an igneous well, at the time, magma, which cooled to become a plutonic igneous rock. Both the sedimentary and the igneous rock were eroded. They were weathered because it cuts through it here. This stratum was then piled on top of it. So that came later. And later on, the Colorado River cut its way down to make the Grand Canyon. And we see all of it together. And now we can tell sequences in time. Or here, we can figure out the strata had to be here before they got folded. And they're all folded together, a single folding event. And over here, 
Strata deposited, oldest to youngest, folded, eroded, new strata on top. And so by the late 1700s and the dawn of the 1800s, people could figure out the jobs to figure out the physical, uh, the relative sequence in time based on physical stratigraphy. So again, here's a set of strata eroded, and then an intrusion intruded into them. Both those strata and the igneous intrusion were eroded. Then a new, new uh, level of strata was deposited on top of that erosional surface. Then a new igneous intrusion came along. And then another erosional surface that cut through both the old strata and the igneous intrusion. And then new strata on top of that. And in this case, there wasn't actually folding involved with this, with this weathering surface. So the strata below and above are actually parallel to each other. But since it cuts right through this intrusion, that's one of the things that shows us that there was an erosional surface. The thing is, although you could do this for any particular spot on the planet, you couldn't extend this information of sequence and time to another region. It was very difficult to correlate from region to region the sequence of events. You needed something else. The first thing that people figured out in terms of correlation is what we call lithostratigraphy. Correlation in a region by the bodies of rock. So stratigraphy by rock type, lithostratigraphy. Because remember, every rock is a record of the environment that, in which it was formed. And so while a particular region was in a particular depositional environment, that body of rock was being generated over that region. And we call these sequences of strata, these bodies of rocks, formations. To a geologist, uh, a, a natural bridge or a stalactite or whatever, those are not geologic formations. A geologic formation is a sequence of strata representing shared depositional history, or shared common depositional history. And what we're looking at here are a set of formations different colors, representing different rock types and different environments. In this case, in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming, representing actually a time period from the what we call the Late Jurassic up into the Cretaceous period. So if you think about it, you know, today, the alluvial deposits, the uh, stream-generated deposits, of the Mississippi River system and the delta deposits of the Mississippi Delta potentially could be future formations. They have a similar origin. They're being formed in the same general period of time. They have similar source rocks. And we can go back in time and we can see like bands of strata horizontally representing different environments that were in around the same uh, time, but at each spot, different environments at we're depositing, and which would become different formations. And you can even go within a single formation and look at the strata from the base to the top, and even maybe even document changes of the style of deformation. So this is the long history it's called the Chinle Formation. All formations have a formal name. The Chinle Formation, which is at Petrified Forest National Park. And actually, here's a look at that whole stack of the Chinle Formation, and its current distribution. In black, you see where those rocks are currently exposed on the surface of the world. And that C is um, Petrified Forest uh, National Park. OK. Well, here's one formation I like to dig in when I get a chance, called the Morrison Formation, named after the town of Morrison, Colorado. But it spreads from southern Canada down to the American Southwest. It formed during what we call the Late Jurassic. And it formed as the alluvial plains, the river systems and lakes and unconsolidated sediment that was being eroded off the young Rocky Mountains towards the interior of the continent. And in this formation, we find lots of, say, dinosaur bones and other creatures from this time. And right here, we see the boundary between the Morrison Formation and the Cloverly Formation. It turns out. Well, first of all, we see it as a change of color because there's different types of sedimentation going on. 
different source rocks and so forth. So there's a difference in the quality of the sediments. And it turns out that was a big gap in time. That actually is an unconformity. And here we have described the sequence of rocks of the Bighorn Basin. And what I showed you was right there, the boundary between the Morrison and the Cloverly. Shown with that little wiggly line that shows unconformity. Now, a little bit about some technical terminology. Formations are sometimes grouped together in what geologists very clearly call groups. So multiple formations together, representing a larger shared history are called groups. Or formations, sometimes groups are grouped into supergroups. We'll encounter a supergroup later on. On the other direction, a formation can sometimes be subdivided into what we call members. And these represent slight de differences in the depositional history. So formation, the basic unit, formations grouped into groups, groups grouped into supergroups. You're not obliged to do that, but you can. And formations can be subdivided into members. Just to let you know that, that terminology. I'm going to wrap up today with the introduction of the principle of fossil succession. And this guy, William Strata Smith, that was his nickname in his own lifetime. Unlike most of the people I've mentioned in course, the course so far, although similar to, uh, to Mary Anning that I mentioned in one of the early lectures, this is a working class guy. In this case, his profession was uh, as a, what we would now say, a civil engineer. He designed canal systems at a time when canals were the primary way that people were beginning to move goods across Great Britain and the world. And so he was very much familiar with the rocks that he was digging through and very dedicated to recording the different changes of rocks as they would go through them and mapping them out. And also describing the characteristics of these rocks. And one of the things he noted is that most fossil species were found in only one or maybe a succession of a couple formations. That most fossil species were not found in multiple formations. Now, he was not interested in fossils as a key to ancient life. He was interested in fossils because they were telling him what sequence of rocks were going to be out there and what he would predict they would next have to be digging through in the next unit. And so he developed what he called, the, well, what became called the principle of fossil succession. And that's just simply the observation that fossil species have a particular range in geologic time. Some might be short ranges, some might be long ranges in time. But any two rocks containing the same species were both had to be deposited between the origin of that species and the extinction of that species. So if we have two rocks that contain this sort of coral, they're not necessarily simul they didn't necessarily form simultaneously, but those two rocks had to be formed sometime between the first appearance and the last appearance of that species. Now, Smith himself, again, was not interested in the biology of these things. He didn't care why they were coming into being and why they disappeared. They were, for him, markers. But now think about this. If we find a rock that contains this critter, little colonial plankton, and this starfish, and this coral. Well, then that rock has to be from the time the three of these overlap. Because all three of them had to have been alive at the time it happened. Or if we find a rock that contains this coral, this uh, cephalopod, and this curly Q guy, it had to be from the time that these overlap. And so it began to be able to narrow down when in time any particular layer happened. So I'll wrap up with this sequence. Yeah, that's the slide. Correlation over greater distances using fossils called biostratigraphy. Stratigraphy based on life. So here we see a sequence. Red curly cues, green bullets, and blue oysters, who no doubt form a cult. There. OK, it's a four-year time. And so we can tell the sequence in time here between when the blue oysters lived and when the blue oysters and the green bullets lived, and when the red curlicues lived. And then we find two other sets of formation, two other sets of rocks at other spots. And we can find some things like the purple starfish that aren't down here, and other critters that were of, of 
uh, over there. And now we've made the big jump that will be the centerpiece of next time. From multiple spots correlated together, we can begin to create a time scale, not based on the layers of strata, which are going to be limited to one depositional basin, but based on the sequence of fossils through time. And this is the beginning of the discovery of the geologic time scale. So we'll pick that up next time and why certain fossils are good for this and others not so much. Take care. If you didn't already, make sure you scan the QR code for the same reason. Yeah, you got the email. It's important. Remember, masks up. Masks include the nose. We respire through our nostrils as well as the mouth.